Hey everyone, Matt here, and I'm gonna be restoring this Pioneer SX636 receiver today. I picked this up in Eastern Washington. It seems like it had been in someone's shop for a long time, had lots of dust on the inside, it really needed to be cleaned up. So if you want to see me replace the dial face lamps with cool blue LEDs, as well as the dial pointer with a red LED and replace one of these painfully frustrating to replace incandescent bulbs for the input selector. We're also gonna clean these push button switches that are just a little bit staticky and clean the controls and recap the whole unit and check the transistors and tune up the amplifier, make sure the power supply is all good to go. We're gonna replace the main filter capacitors as well. If you wanna see all of that, just keep on watching and I'll show you how to do it. <laughs> All right, so I've already done some cleaning on this because my original intent was not to actually film this just because I want to strike a balance between me just enjoying this and me making videos about it. So I already went through and cleaned it. I know that this receiver works already. It just has some dirty controls. And so we are gonna just test the power supply and make sure all the voltages are kind of you know close to spec. And then we'll go into recapping it. And we just want to make sure that the power supply is looking solid before we move forward. So we'll go ahead and turn it on. On pin six, we're supposed to have, supposed to have 31 volts, we do. Pin two, we're supposed to have negative, that's our negative 31 volt, we have negative 31. On pin 17, we're supposed to have 30 volt, we have 30. Pins 13 and 14, we're supposed to have 13 volts and six volts, interesting. There's too many volts on pin 14. So we've got too much power going to pin 14. Should only be six volts going there. On pin 10, we're supposed to have negative 41 volts. And we do. And if you're gonna be like touching fuses and stuff, just a reminder, don't always show this on camera, but you always wanna drain the filter capacitors. Just make sure that you're not touching too much stuff in here. Electronic work is dangerous. But I'm gonna keep poking around in the power supply and see if we can find any other voltages that seem off. You can also see at this point that we're gonna be putting a new power cord on this because uh, the old one got chopped near the end. All right, so I had a second, so I thought that I would just replace this power cord really quick. I got the replacement power cord as a takeoff on eBay, just off of a Pioneer SX535. All right, so a string relief is made up of two parts. You can see we have this smaller part here that kind of slides in and out this way, and then we have the main part. Special set of strain relief pliers, but in order to actually use these, you would put them around the sides like this. You have to kind of create a gap. You can kind of push down and in, and then you can put your strain relief pliers just on the sides and on the back and just wiggle it out like so. And then you can see that it comes in part into, oops, it actually broke. Takes quite a bit of heating to get these up because there's so much wire and solder. There we go. Quite a bit of heating indeed. There is our old power cord. All right, now we can run our new cord in. Because there's no polarity on the plug, they're just the same size prong, you can just solder them however you want. All we have to do is just put a little bit of extra in here and then grab our strain relief. I'm gonna use the strain relief pliers to smash the wire down. Like so, I think it's not smushed enough. There we go. A little wee bit more smooshing goes in. You got a little bit of slack back here, which is important. Make sure all the wires are fine. When you wiggle it, you can't pull it or anything. It's just secured. By the way, happy Super Bowl Sunday. I'm going to be watching the Super Bowl with some friends and uh, you'll be seeing this come out in like a month or something like that. So it won't be Super Bowl Sunday, but are you happy with the outcome of the Super Bowl? Leave it as a comment, you know, let me know. Were you rooting for the Chiefs or the 49ers? And this bottom cover is really dusty, so I'm gonna go clean it really fast. And just like that, nice and clean. One of the most satisfying parts of fixing old receivers, cleaning off the years of dust. Something else that's really important to watch is the voltage on your main filter capacitors on these. We have 25 volts DC off of this capacitor still. And off of the other one, we have negative 26 volts. And you, you know, that's not like, lethal necessarily, but it sure wouldn't feel good to be hit with that. And so what we have is our lovely little tool here for draining. There's some great videos on how to make these on the internet, but basically it's just a brass rod with a resistor in line that you connect to ground. And then you can just hold it on your capacitor for, for a few seconds. Making one of these, I think it cost me less than $10 to get the materials to make like a few of them. And 
it is definitely worth your time. Because now, if we go back and measure our voltage, we've got one volt on that one, and we've got negative 0.95 volts on the other one. Now I'm gonna get into rebuilding the power supply and there are just metal hooks that are normally in these little clamps over here that you can just bend and then pull off and then these you just pinch them and then slowly lift one side of the board up and then the other. I've already done that. And then if you loosen some wires on the bottom on for this side over here, this will come up high enough to be able to solder a little bit on it, lift it over like so. So that's what it looks like right now and I'm gonna replace all the components and then you'll see what it looks like. All right, so that's what our power board looks like now. Fresh capacitors, all Nichicon UPW. These are our old capacitors and I tested them all on my peak capacitor tester and they all tested to be within 12% of spec. So all these in here have a 20, up to a 20% tolerance. So all of those were very much in spec still. So let's power it on and see if I did it right. Alrighty, dim bulb tester is over here and we'll turn this on and barely lit up. Everything is great. Now we can go ahead and I'll probably be moving on to the Fano stage. So on the underside, this is our Fano board, also called the equalizer amp board. There are four transistors on here, two for each channel, that are the 2SC 1344, those are known baths. And then we have four electrolytic capacitors on here, and then these red blobs on each side, those are tantalums. And then we have two more tantalums at the front. Just for kicks and giggles, these are the parts we're putting in. We have matched pairs of KC 1845s. We have the four 0.47, uh, microfarad film capacitors. We have the, I believe, the 22 or 100 UF microfarad uh, 35 volt, 3.3 UF tantalums, and 22 microfarad uh, 10 volt electrolytics. All right, so I finished the Fano stage. We got the new capacitors and transistors in. These three capacitors, uh, these two tested a little bit higher on ESR. They're 22 microfarad, and they're a few uh, ohms resistance, which is higher than we'd like to see for something that's, that's that size. And then this capacitor was about 26% out of spec. All right, so I've got it powered on. We're not even on the dim bulb anymore. I checked all the power supply voltages. They're all looking great. The only thing is crackly. All right, so we were testing aux. Now we're testing Fano. And the Fano stage sounds fine. The only thing I did notice is that if we carefully, if we wiggle the RCA jack on the back, when I first plugged it in, it was humming. So I think the connection's a little bit loose on that jack. So we're just gonna clean all the connections, the inputs and outputs on the back panel. Something that I did notice that's really cool about this receiver is it has a 1977 sticker on it and it looks like it was purchased in Europe. Biel, Bien, or however you would say that, is in Switzerland. Kinda neat. It has a voltage selector, so currently it's set to 120, but it can also be set to 220. So for cleaning, I'm just gonna start with my microfiber and just clean all the dust off as much as I can. I just use a little bit of Deoxit D100L on the end of the RCA jacks too, and then I just plug it in and I just spin it around. So next up is the power amp. This is what it looks like currently. We're gonna be replacing these two 1451 transistors and then checking all the outputs and replacing one, two, three, six capacitors. So not many capacitors. There are these four transistors up here are not known bad, so we're just gonna leave those in place. Access to this board is super easy, just right in the center. We don't even have to unmount the board or remove any covers. All right, and there we go. We have Nichicon UKZ, UPW, new transistors, Wyma film capacitors. These transistors were very high gain and they were also separate, uh, about 60 HFE different. Not not ideal, right? But they're old, so it's that's acceptable. These cap these capacitors all measured fine, but then these two blue uh, capacitors were just bad. Their ESR was 12 and a half ohms, should be like two maybe, and then the other one was like seven and a half ohms. All right, we've got it on dim bulb over there. Bright bulb goes away. I've got it all hooked up, and the preamp controls are still dirty, but it sounds great. Bono section sounds great. I'm going to relamp this. My cat is here. Come on, Chinook. Oh yeah. What a good little man. You're such a good little guy. All right, so for the lamps, I thought I'd give a bit more of an in-depth tutorial on exactly how to replace them, just because I realized that there isn't one on YouTube. These bulbs right here for the source indicator, one of the FM1 is burned out. Then you have this uh, five, I believe, 
five fuse bulbs in here, and then you also have two more fuse bulbs in here. If it's just the dial face bulbs that are out, you don't actually have to take off this whole front piece. It's not a pain to take off, but you wanna be really careful with it. You can't push this off with that dial face on because the indicator gets in the way. So if you're just trying to replace dial lamps, it actually makes more sense to take off the little guard uh, that's over this circuit board. It's just two screws on the sides. It's really easy. And then you can take this third screw out right here, and then you can just fold this board up. I only removed this because I wasn't sure if I had to pull the bulbs out for the, the source from the front, but these ones just come in from the back, but they're also glued in. And so I've been yanking on this and you can see that I ripped a wire here. You could use a drill bit or something and just drill them out. Yeah, these things are a pain. Just, if you don't have to replace them, just don't. These two bulbs over here, um, there's just this little brown paper thing that just goes on top of, uh, basically just to protect the meters, but that goes on top of there. And then you've got two screws. You have one in the top here and then one in the back of this housing. And then this piece just comes off and you can just pull it back and you can put the bulbs in. Ooh, and that is why I'm wearing glasses. And if I wasn't, I'd be wearing safety glasses. <laughs> All right, so I just used a drill with a small drill bit, one that's just about the right size for the lamp to drill a hole through the lamp, as you can see right there. So then once I drilled that out, I was able to vacuum out in here, make sure I didn't get too much dust or whatever glass in there. And got then after I drilled through it, I was able to pull the lamp out this side. And this is the bulb we'll be putting in there. It's just a four millimeter incandescent grain of wheat bulb is what they're called. I just got this one from Parts Express. I have a bunch of them. I replaced this with a red LED and I had been so, it's been a couple weeks of me working on this. You probably already know this if you've just taken yours apart, but this wire for the tuning dial comes up. You put this cover back on and then it comes up and over and spirals around itself and then underneath this tuning wire. You just wanna make sure that you test and that this dial can go all the way over to the one side and to the other side and that there's enough wire for it to not get hindered. I was thinking about replacing all these lights up here with LEDs, but I don't have the right colors of LEDs, so they're all just incandescents, but everything else is LED and all these incandescents work now. All right, so I just have a little bit of time to do the work on the preamp board. That one at the front here has all the switches on it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna clean all these switches and knobs, place all the capacitors, transistors, uh, and these couple tantalum capacitors here. So there's one, two, and then there's one here two screws around these buttons and then two screws around these buttons and then two more washers and nuts here. Basically, you can just kind of push on here. I've pulled some of these wires out of the locking clips or just the guides from the top and the bottom so that we have some slack. And then you just need to lift the back of the board and push uh, a little bit. And basically you just push and pull and you watch for things that it's getting hung up on. So now it's hung up. If you push the buttons in, it gives you a bit more, bit more clearance. It's out, and now I'm gonna replace components on it. All right, so this, I'm coming back after I thought I finished this receiver to clean these push switches because there were a couple that still had static on them. And I just put it in this section of the video because we're cleaning the switches and I figured I might as well. This is, these switches are also a lot easier to clean than I originally thought they would be because there's no holes in them. Uh, so at first they're like, oh, you can't just spray cleaner in there or anything. And I've never disassembled them before, but I learned how to disassemble them and it turns out it's really easy. Now I already removed the metal bracket that holds all these switches together and actually desoldered these two switches here using my new Paco desoldering gun, which is really useful and it's amazing for pulling these switches out, but I also don't, it's not necessary to desolder them because all you have to do is you can use a fine pair of tweezers. I love my tweezers. And you just pull back this spring that's at the front and then the pen, I know it's kind of hard to see, but this pen right here pulls up and out. So you pull back the spring to get it off the top of the pen and then you just pull that pen up and out and then you can literally just pull this whole switch out. These are metal and metal contacts, so you can use Deoxit D5, or in my case, I'm gonna use Deoxit D100 after we just spray it out with some quick, quick dry electronics uh, contact cleaner. And with this stuff, it just dries really fast, and so it doesn't, it doesn't leave a residue or anything like that. I can use my air blaster and dry it up really quickly, whereas the Deoxit will leave an oily residue all over the board. So that's why I prefer to use the D100L. And you can see there's kind of a rib on the bottom that lines up with this gap that's in here on the black plastic. You can just line that up and stick it in and you can just push the switch in without having to push those contacts in. If they are hanging up a little bit, you might have to kind of nudge them in and then I'll just toss a little bit of D100. It does not take much. 
work that switch carefully into there. And then before you put that metal pen back in, you can just work the switch across the contacts. Just make sure you get them nice and coated with deoxit. And then all you have to do is compress this spring back up. Front of the pen goes in there. It goes in the curved end first. Push the switch in a bit more. And boom, there you go. Got a fresh clean switch. Okay, so of course the last switch that I'm putting in, I lose a spring. Luckily, it landed inside the receiver and I was able to tip the receiver upside down and to have it stuck to my magnet here now so I don't lose it. I forgot to say this, these plates are not held in, in place securely, so they can just fall out of the bottom of the switch. And if they do that, the spring will just rock it out the side and you will probably not find it. All right, so I finished the font, the preamp board. We got new six new transistors, however many capacitors in there. I also cleaned all the controls while I was in there. You can take the backs off the controls by just lifting these two metal tabs on each side. You can just lift one tab and then just this whole back cover comes off. So I took those off and cleaned the controls inside and out. And then I also replaced the filter capacitors. The filter replacements that I bought, unfortunately, were a little bit too small. So I made these gaskets for them that hold them in place and wired them up. I wanted to talk about the components I pulled out. So we have had two tantalum electrolytic capacitors and then the rest were just aluminum electrolytics. And then we had the six transistors, all were known bad. So we just replaced them all. And then we pulled out the two main filter capacitors, which are some 6,800 microfarad, 35 volts, replaced them with 6,800, 80 volts. And these were actually the only three components that were out of spec. This capacitor was 27% out of spec, the 100 microfarad 35 volt capacitor from the preamp. And then this filter capacitor was at 3,700 microfarad. And then this one was at 4,700. And the new ones measure both right around 6,400. I just cleaned and polished the faceplate. I just used Mother's aluminum mag and aluminum polish on there. Nice and shiny, made sure that there's no as few swirls and things in the glass as possible. Now I've just got to put the washers and the nuts back on to hold it in place, as well as these two screws up here at the top. I got the faceplate back on, most of the knobs, or I need to clean the knobs and polish them, but lights are looking good. The only downside is that the antenna's a little, or the dial pointer's a little crooked. And it was really hard to get it even that straight with the new LED in there, because it was a little bigger. So we're gonna say that that's okay. I couldn't stand it, so I took the faceplate off and bent this back. It was sticking out and a little over, so I bent it back in, and it's now much better. It's time to adjust the bias for the amplifier. So for the left channel, I'm hooked up. I need to wait a couple more minutes. According to the service manual, you want to wait 10 minutes till after it's turned on, and then it should be at 20 millivolts. We're sitting right around 20 millivolts on the left channel right now at about five minutes after power up with the dummy load resistors on speaker A. You want to have speaker A turned on, volume all the way down, function input set to aux, and then just leave it for 10 minutes. So I'll be back in a couple minutes to check in on this. Already got you on the tripod. It's been 10 minutes now, and we are hovering exactly at 20 millivolts. So no adjustments required on the left channel, but I am just gonna go ahead and test the right channel, which is gonna be pins eight and pin 11. Just make sure you don't connect to the wrong pin because that will not be a happy moment for your amplifier. Pins eight and pin 11, we're getting 20.5 millivolts pretty much spot on. We could try to adjust that a little bit. There we go. So this amplifier is running great. I'm gonna go ahead and test all the functions now and just make sure that everything works and get the case cleaned up. All right, so I've got it hooked up to test. With the highest rated song in the world. The radio works good. Stereo indicator light comes on. Love it. The tuning is also like pretty much spot on. So this is 1065 and it's 1065 on here. I'm gonna polish up the knobs. I just use a magic eraser, just clean them up really good. And then I put a little mother's magnum aluminum polish on them. This is gonna be for sale on my eBay. Uh, by the time this video comes out, it may have already sold. I have no idea, but if it's still available, it'll stay in the pinned comment below. So thank you so much for watching. Bye.